It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Njenga Munene uh, to give his presentation uh, that he prepared uh, for this conference. So over to you, uh, Professor Njenga Munene in absentia. So good morning for those who are in the region where we are and good uh, night for those who are in the United States. I know it's still uh, at night. And uh, good morning for those who are in countries like Germany, uh, where the sun is uh, have just risen. I want to greet you all uh, on this particular morning and uh, to present a short discussion on emerging pandemic threats and other global challenges implications of lessons learned on innovations and technology in one health education. So my name is Professor Njenga Monene, a veterinary surgeon um, who have taught in the university for 34 years and uh, have been very keen in research in one health. Having been involved a lot in doing research in Kibera, where there is close interactions of humans and animals and where zoonoses sometimes do occur and these are the issues that we need to look at when it comes to one health i am also one of the founder deans of the one health uh, eastern central africa which was a share and now changed to afro -Hume. and i'm happy that it is growing and changing but uh, Professor Bazio of Makere has not changed. I think he's still the same strong and focused leader. And that's why uh, Afro Hoon is still growing. So I greet you all and welcome you to my short presentation. This slide um, shows uh, people preparing to bury uh, a person who died of COVID-19 uh, last year. And uh, one of the things that uh, made COVID-19 such a scare was the way we handled uh, cases of people who died. The people uh, responded with fear. Uh, they responded with apprehension, which, which is natural for things that uh, people don't understand. Uh, and uh, the way people are being treated when they were suspect cases of uh, uh, cases, suspect cases, and instead of uh, seeing people who uh, got infected with uh, uh, COVID, they became victims. And uh, therefore, the language itself uh, and the fear uh, that was instilled by arresting people who are suspected of COVID-19 created a very difficult position for many people. And that's why a lot of people ended up not presenting themselves in hospitals uh, to be treated because of the stigmatization that was occurring as far as COVID-19 was concerned. But over the many years, uh, there has been notable pandemics in the last 100 years. The Spanish flu, 1918 to 1919. And they say that in some places it went on up to 1922, which was a period of four years. So we are not yet through with four years. And over 40 million people died out of the H1N1, the swine flu. Um, what uh, many people have never understood and the scientists have yet to determine whether the H1N1 came from humans to pigs or it came from pigs uh, to humans, but whichever way it ended up uh, killing very many uh, uh, people in the world. And uh, the use of masks was intense uh, at that time. The Asian flu, what they call the influenza pandemic, it was caused by H2N2, 1956 to 1958. About 2 million people died. Influenza pandemic, H3N2, 1968, about a million people died. And the continuing pandemic, uh, the HIV AIDS, 1981 to date, about that 6.3 million uh, people have died of HIV up to the year 2020. 
But those of you who remember how HIV was in the 80s, people had the same phobia and fear, uh, like they do have for, for COVID-19 today. SARS 2002, uh, 2004, a coronavirus, the deaths were few, but uh, it is good that uh, the world acted very fast and contained uh, the disease before widespread um, spread in the, in, in the world. 774 people died, that's more number compared to what have uh, been lost. Swine flu. Influenza A virus, 2009. Interestingly, this one was caused by the same virus that caused the 1918-1919 Spanish flu. And uh, 575,400 people died. Uh, fortunately, it was also contained uh, fairly fast and did not spread as quickly as has happened today. The Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Corona, 2012 to date, still spreading, but low grade. Uh, so far, 941 people have died as of May 2020. And now the latest of our scare and uh, what is killing many people. Uh, there are few people who don't know people who have died uh, of COVID-19. Uh, from 2019 to date, so far, 5.17 million have died, and the numbers are growing by the day. It is something that is worrisome. But more interesting is what have Corona does? Corona has changed the way we do things. So what are the factors that have been influencing spread of uh, diseases across boundaries? and across uh, populations, human and animal interactions, eating habits, uh, sexual behavior like uh, HIV AIDS, human social behavior and activities, air travel and other human movements. These have been major when it comes to spread of uh, coronavirus. Uh, those of you uh, who can remember this short history of uh, the virus starting from Wuhan and literally spreading in the world within a very short time. Uh, this mainly was facilitated by human travel and uh, the lockdowns that followed uh, through the spread, probably a much bigger population would have been lost had we not contained uh, human travel. Other diseases like avian flu, uh, bad migration, misinformation. Uh, currently uh, uh, in Kenya and quite a few countries, not a few, many countries of the world, there's resistance to vaccination. And uh, this is mainly fueled by misinformation. People are not being given the right information and uh, our inability to counter that misinformation, especially through the social media, uh, remains a big uh, challenge to ensuring that uh, vaccination occurs uh, throughout all the vulnerable human population. So not following established proved, uh, proven protocols. Some people are still very resistant to wearing masks, uh, this weekend, I met uh, a couple. Uh, the husband is very concerned because the wife is extremely resistant. Uh, she says she doesn't want to wear the masks and she doesn't want to be vaccinated. So the husband has, uh, has been vaccinated. Uh, he wears a mask, but uh, he was saying, please pray for me that uh, my wife doesn't end up with uh, coronavirus because I am extremely vulnerable with that. So the resistance has been great in terms of vaccinations and in terms of, um, in, in terms of uh, following protocols. Uh, I'm told by a friend of mine who lives in Belgium that uh, there are some regions where they cannot talk about vaccination without the risk of uh, getting backlash from their neighborhood. 
So this is something that we all need to think through and ask ourselves whether we are actually acting on information or we are acting on uh, rumors. This is a, a picture that uh, was uh, put on, on media on uh, COVID-19 affecting lions in Singapore. And this was also happening to the people who are taking care of uh, these lions. So the government agency said for Asiatic uh, lions at the night safari, as well as one African lion at the Singapore Zoo, zoo had exhibited mild signs of sickness including coughing, sneezing, and lethargy. And therefore, and they tested positive for COVID-19. And this was upon exposure to staff from Andai Wildlife Group who later tested positive for COVID-19. Therefore, we must ask ourselves, is it possible that the current outbreak can be sustained and maintained within the animal population? so that even as we vaccinate human beings, that there can be risk of continued sustenance of the virus within the animal population. And this is important for us as uh, scientists to consider when it comes to research on COVID-19, just like it is with the diseases like rabies, which have both a wild cycle, what we call the sylvatic cycle, and the domestic cycle, where the virus is maintained within the bats and within the wild uh, canines. And then once it gets to the domestic canines, it ends up as a fair within the human population. We must be concerned about the emerging and re-emerging diseases. Emerging infections, a new or newly identified pathogen or syndrome, that has been colonized over the last two or three decades that has resulted in new manifestations of infectious diseases. The emerging diseases or what they call resurging diseases, known or previously identified pathogens or syndrome that is increasing in incidence, expanding into new geographic areas, affecting new population groups or threatening to increase in the near future. These are diseases that have been found around for decades or centuries, but have come back in different form or locations. It is important for all of us to remember, and I think that is something that all of us need to be reminded. The 75% of emerging and emerging diseases as were noted. They are shared between animals and humans. And therefore, we must get concerned that when we start having the emerging diseases, and emerging diseases. Emerging diseases, these have been the pandemics we have talked about, H5N1, avian influenza, the Nipah virus, Hedra virus, Enterovirus, SARS, Hadra virus, Brumunai syndrome, Lassa virus, uh, Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome, and now COVID-19. Those can be classified as emerging diseases because they were not there for a very long time. Uh, the prions, you remember the issue of uh, 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 the variant Krejfeld jacob disease, uh, which is a human form of uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, a product uh, which is uh, suspected to have moved from sheep uh, to animal feeds or cattle feed, and then the uh, bovine, and then uh, at the end of the day, affecting humans. Bacterial ones, E. coli O157, uh, H7, anthrax uh, has remained as a threat because of its use in bioterrorism, and uh, protozoal diseases like cryptosporidiosis. The emerging or resurging diseases, Ebola, uh, this uh, mainly uh, seems to be fueled by our eating habits of uh, occasionally eating the, the, our neighbors, our near relatives, the apes in the tropical forest, uh, which is a very big risk. 
Rift Valley fever. I like Cray uh, outbreak every time we have excess rains because of the nature of its spread. The human monkeypox, the West Nile virus, dengue fever, yellow fever, and Marburg hemorrhagic fever. All these are resurging diseases. And depending on the environment, they can recur with the serious uh, consequences. Bacteria cholera, this is a disease known for many years, typhoid fever, diphtheria, plague, vancomycin resistant staphylococcus aureus, and multi drug resistant tuberculosis, protozoal diseases, drug resistant malaria. And it's the, the, especially the issue of resistance to antibiotics or antimicrobials. Uh, it must remain as a top concern for all of us as human beings. We are not discovering new antimicrobials every so often. Yet the continued abuse and misuse of antimicrobials, either in uh, the human population or in livestock, uh, remains a big challenge and continues to remain a threat uh, to human beings in terms of disease control and uh, containment of uh, diseases. Factors that are responsible for emerging and emerging of diseases, economic development, poverty, poor sanitation, land use and close human animal interactions, climate change, human demographics and behavior, international travel and commerce, and misuse of antimicrobials. Because as we talk about human economic development, too many things change. People tend to encroach to increase the agricultural output encroaching into forest areas. Poverty, poor sanitation, land use, and uh, human interactions. All these are issues that we must get concerned as human beings as we continue to think about how to deal with our problems. Other major global challenges that affect uh, human and animal health, industrial waste, solid, liquid, and gases. All of us know of situations where gases uh, or liquids or solids have found their way into the food chain in the long run, either through animals or directly through to us, we end up uh, getting uh, into problems with the pollutants, pollution of fresh water sources, service and underground, uh, too much nitrogen, too much fertilizers, too much uh, pesticides. These are products and requirements when you are doing uh, commercial agriculture. And that has tended to uh, cause serious pollution of uh, water. And uh, the world must be concerned because the, the fresh water constitutes an extremely small percentage of uh, global water volume. Most of the water worldwide is only about 2% is fresh water. The rest of the water, almost 98%, uh, over 95% of water is uh, uh, salty and therefore not uh, suitable for human consumption. Social media and unproven information on the world, world, world wide web. This has been a disaster in this COVID-19 period. All manner of falsehoods have been spread that the Vaccine is uh, people are being tagged with uh, chips uh, and all manner of things. People are going to become infertile. Uh, men will stop uh, producing and so will women. And all those uh, things have been spread to an extent that people have come to believe that it is possible that they are causing problems. And uh, we must uh, readdress ourselves to the value that uh, false uh, uh, descriptions of what vaccines will result to will lead to. Let me now take a little time and talk a little about One Health. Uh, One Health uh, recognizes the interdependence of human, animal, and environmental health, and that a holistic, uh, and that a holistic approach uh, of well-being for all will lead to improved health outcomes and enhanced resilience. Because we live in one world, our animals, ourselves, 
And in that environment is where we grow, that's what we eat, it's where we live. We don't have another world to live in. And therefore, one health becomes a, a, it's a, it's a global contract between ourselves, between our animals and between our environment. So that uh, our environment produces what we need, provides the environment in which we live and suitable for both our animals and ourselves. And a breakdown on either side will always lead to a problem on the other side. When we have human activities that destroy the environment, it will have consequences in health, it will have consequences in animal uh, welfare, it will have consequences in human welfare. If you look at this uh, presentation, and this was uh, in Kibera, you can see very nice ducks uh, scavenging on open uh, drains and human beings uh, doing their own things. And the risk, of course, is that uh, these ducks will produce eggs, which will be eaten, or they themselves will be food on the table. But at the end of the day, you must ask yourself, what will happen if prob probably there is contamination of this uh, food and people end up eating it? What is the composition of what these animals are eating? That cannot be described unless an analysis is done of the content of the water flowing, the waste water. So these animals can be a big source of problems to the people who are waiting to eat those animals either themselves as meat or their products as eggs. These are pigs uh, scavenging in uh, open sewers, open drains. They still find their way on the table for people to eat. And you must ask ourselves, what is the repercussion? What is the effect? What are the likely out, uh, outcomes? Either the, the animals will have contamination of bacteria or they will end up with metals within the muscles, which in itself uh, creates a risk uh, to human health. See this kind of situation, children uh, doing different things uh, in an open dump, dump site, the risks for these children being pricked by sharps and uh, injured, the risk of breathing uh, wrong things and even uh, getting themselves uh, infected because the composition of the garbage, uh, nobody knows what it is. It could be medical materials, it could be uh, industrial material, it could be a risk to these children. And therefore, the interaction between the environment and the people who are living in this kind of uh, environment becomes a very real risk uh, to human health. So we must ask ourselves, what are the healthcare, in, uh, healthcare innovations? Healthcare innovation is to develop or improve health policies, systems, products, and technologies and services, and delivery methods that improve people's health with a special focus on needs of vulnerable population. And there have been several uh, advancements. The electronic health records, the M health, the telemedicine, telehealth, Auto technology, self-service uh, kiosk, remote monitoring tools, sensor and wearable technology. These days you can wear a watch that tells you the rate of your pass, the, the kilometers you have walked and the balance you need to walk to burn enough uh, calories, wireless communication. And in Kenya, during COVID-19, 
there was great increase in the use of mobile money. We have been uh, a leader in uh, electronic money transfer. And this reduced enormously the need for people to go to the shops and uh, collect cash, which in itself was a big innovation. And uh, it is important to appreciate the government for ensuring that the charges were reduced for small amounts of money and therefore taking care of the highly vulnerable uh, groups. Positive effects of technology, they have helped in tracking of uh, chronic illnesses and communicate uh, vital information to doctors. The health apps have helped in track uh, diets, exercise, and mental information. Online medical services uh, records that give access to test results and allow you to fill prescriptions. Virtual doctors. This was and is very hard during this COVID-19 COVID pandemic. People are avoiding going to hospitals simply because they think the hospitals are very high risk. And therefore, uh, a lot of uh, discussions uh, occur between doctors and the patients. Is the genetic profiling of different serotypes on variants of pathogens? It's much easier than it was before and highly automated vaccine production and fast supply chain. All these are products of uh, technology. So what are the lessons on COVID-19 response? The first thing I would like to say is that COVID-19 has been a real disruptor of uh, a normal life. As a teaching institution ourselves, uh, we had to close the face-to-face -face learning. But uh, our response determined on whether we were going to survive as, a, as an enterprise or we were going to sink as an enterprise. And as a response, uh, we ensured that we transited from face-to-face -face learning to digital learning within three days. The beauty is that the bureaucracy, we don't have bureaucracy and therefore we updating our systems took only two days and we are back to normal teaching. And the lessons that we learned were uh, very, very, very deep in terms of the value of other players when it comes to COVID-19. There is need, in my view, for continued preparation for an expected outbreak of disease. Uh, I don't think there was a country that was ready for COVID-19. That's why even the most developed countries had, where they, when the infections became too many, they had to pitch tents and create hospitals out of parking lots. We didn't have enough respirators and neither did we have enough ICU beds globally. And therefore, in my view, it is important for us to continue preparing for the unknown in order to avoid situations where we can land with what we landed with last year and part of this year. The world needs to be better connected and institutions need to be more connected. For us, we were extremely lucky that Kenneth uh, which supplies uh, internet services to institutions, uh, to universities and institutions, was extremely supportive. We were also very, very lucky that uh, Safaricom came in and supported us a lot in giving bundles for our students at very subsidized cost. And therefore, the interconnections that we had, the issue of CRISP, the Kenya Library, uh, information uh, services, uh, availing uh, online material uh, to our students enabled them to continue with learning because of the connectivity. And therefore it is important that uh, the world be better connected and the world institutions be better connected. 
I think there's a better aggressive and factual information through all medias of communication to counter misinformation, especially from social media. Thus, making it difficult to contain outbreaks like it is happening with COVID-19. And I think this to me is, a, is, a, is an issue that we need to address very aggressively um, through the uh, normal media, through the social media, so that uh, people can see a different view of what is being given versus -V what is the fact. The other thing is avoiding stigmatization and profiling of affected persons, making other affected persons from seeking medical support in time. This to me was one of the biggest problems of managing COVID-19 at the beginning. People are afraid of saying they, they are sick and quite a number of people died in their homes, avoiding hospitals, avoiding uh, medical care because uh, they were being treated like they are uh, literally the cause of the problem they were in. And considering that the virus is spread through uh, air, uh, really, there, there, is, there is no contribution for, for the person, unless, of course, he goes to the world parties and food that are happening in other countries where people want to be infected so that they are not vaccinated. Greater acceptance and practice of e-commerce is a, a big thing. And expanding education on one health in schools and colleges for people to appreciate the need of interconnection of animals, environment, and animal health. We need to address the issue of wealth creation to remove people from extremes of poverty that make them very vulnerable. So we, we need to create uh, wealth and ensure that people are not uh, living in uh, environments that are totally unacceptable for human uh, habitation. The issue of controlled uh, investment in mitigation against pollution, I think is an issue that is global and something we need to think about. And provision of sanitary facilities and uh, san proper sanitation to avoid situations where uh, human population are exposed unnecessarily uh, to uh, either pathogens or pollutants. Being self-reliant in all key needs uh, to handle pandemics and other needs. Uh, you are aware, and all of us are aware, that the supply chain were grossly affected by COVID-19 and uh, travel restrictions. And therefore, every nation must make effort to ensure that they are self-reliant on things that they require to handle issues like pandemics. It calls upon, in my view, for the government to reconsider very seriously uh, either here or in other countries, the issue of supply chain for things that to require uh, a slide. Then accept the new normal of online meetings, whether family, like the one we are holding now, research or in politics. I think one of the biggest uh, challenges in my personal view is that political rallies in Kenya uh, should be banned and all candidates be put uh, to hunt their votes in the media. Now, with the new Omicron uh, variant upside, which is now uh, affecting even people who have been vaccinated, the whole population is put at risk uh, by political meetings. And I think it is only responsible that uh, anybody who wants to ask for votes uh, should do it uh, online uh, and be using media rather than uh, for public meetings. And uh, I think we should also shorten the periods of uh, campaigns. Otherwise, there's a lot of wastage of human talent and human labor. I think that uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. And I want to say this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure uh, to uh, share with you my few thoughts about how we should handle the issue of uh, One Health. I don't think there's uh, any presentation can take uh, cognizance of all the facts that are required for One Health. But it behoves all of us to appreciate that the world we are in is highly interactive 
and our environment and our animals and human, us as human beings, need to share the world and ensure that we live in it in health, both for our animals and ourselves, because essentially we are all interconnected. So I want to wish you everybody well and God's blessings and pray that all of you remain safe.